Oh, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our Dairy Foods office hours today. Um, I think if we have anybody uh, who joins us a, a few minutes late, they'll they'll get um, added in. But I think we've got a full full plan for today, so we should go ahead and get started. Um, Beth, if you want to. Great. So I'm Nicole Martin. I am the Associate Director of the Milk Quality Improvement Program. I'll be um, speaking today and um, joined by a few folks who will um, jump in at the end for questions and answers on our panel. Um, first of all, Chad Gaylor from um, Dairy Management, Inc. And um, then from our Cornell team, Alyosha Termichik, and who's an Extension Associate. And then um, We'll also have uh, CML Kane, who is a, a professor here at, at the university, who will be joining us a bit late today. Um, and then um, Martin Weedman, who may also be joining us late today. And we have some representatives from New York State Ag and Markets um, as well. So we will hear from those folks a little bit later. And I think we're good to get going. So welcome, everybody. All right, so like I said, uh, my name is Nicole Martin. I'm the Associate Director of the Milk Quality Improvement Program. I've been at Cornell for just under 20 years uh, studying the transmission of um, spoilage organisms and pathogens from uh, environmental locations at the farm and in the processing facility into dairy products and their implication on dairy product quality and safety, detection and enumeration methods, um, and then the implications of those, those organisms on um, consumer perceptions of, of dairy products. So I'm excited to talk to you about uh, microbiological testing. I'll tell you that um, my, my big challenge today was to take what I could speak on for uh, five days straight and put it into a um, 40 minute presentation in a coherent way that that we can um, get some good discussion on but I, I hope I've I've hit the mark there. Right. So I think when we talk about microbiological testing in the in the dairy industry, the first part of the conversation has to be what are our goals, and I think that. Um, that there's a commonality between both raw milk testing and finished product testing or processing testing. And um, what I'm gonna lay out today is, is sort of a framework for how to think about microbiological testing in the dairy industry, and then walk through how we would approach that for both from a raw milk perspective, as well as from a finished product perspective. And then I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about some of the common pitfalls that I see in microbiological testing in the, in the dairy industry and, and hopefully get some, um, some questions and some, you know, thought going into sort of what are the things that we see out there that that we can do better. So first of all, this is sort of a tiered system. And um, when I think about a framework for microbiological testing, I really start with um, what are the, the testing methods that we use for prevention? Because prevention, when we're talking about microbial contamination is really the biggest piece of that puzzle and not necessarily from a testing perspective, but from like a thought and an intention perspective. Um, the next is process control. We want to make sure that the process that we're using both at the farm and in the processing facility um, is well managed in a way that prevents um, microbial contamination and keeps risk factors under control. So I'll talk about both of those at the farm and at the, at the processing level. Then monitoring for specific groups of organisms that have either a uh, um, quality impact or a safety impact and really focusing in on those organisms that we we know can cause issues. And then finally, we of course do a lot of maybe probably more than, than um, we want to, but troubleshooting testing. So we do specific microbial tests in order to troubleshoot a spoilage issue, a safety issue. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about about that. But this is the framework. This is the, you know, how I think about where different tests fall. And I'm not going to talk a lot about specific tests, you know, each individual method, because again, I'd be here for five days if I gave that presentation. But what I'm going to talk about is um, 
you know, sort of what are the goals of each of these different types of testing um, levels and things to think about in, in each of them. And, and certainly if you have specific questions about, about tests, we can get to that in the, in the QA. So let's start with this framework at the farm level. Um, so microbiological testing in raw milk. So first of all, from a prevention perspective in, in raw milk, this isn't necessarily focused on testing itself, but it's on management. So it's on what I call um, whole farm management because there are a lot of risk factors at the farm for microbial contamination. And we know this from decades of research um, in the dairy industry at the farm level, what causes microbial contamination of, of raw milk. Um, and so when we use this whole farm management approach, we're looking at things like, um, the environment, the housing area. We're looking at cow level factors. We're looking at um, herd health, so the you know mastitis in the herd, uh, milking time hygiene, equipment factors, water. It's, it really is this very um, large web of factors that that um, contributes. And and when we're looking at prevention at the farm, it's control of those those factors. And we know that we're controlling those factors by using process control testing. Um, what we've seen from a lot of, of research is that the, the various tests that are used on raw milk, so we have a lot of them, we have total bacteria count, we have preliminary incubation count, coliform count, um, laboratory pasteurization count, spore count, a lot of different parameters. What we know is that when, when those counts are low, they tend to be low, right? So good quality raw milk, high quality raw milk has, has low levels of those those various groups of organisms. Um, and when they're high, they tend to be high, right? So when we have a really high total bacteria count, usually our coliform count is high, usually our PI count is high. So, um, so they're associated with each other and that's really driven by the, the risk factors at the farm that lead to contamination in that product. Um, but that being said, the total bacteria count is really the most appropriate overall process control indicator in raw milk um, of, you know, that indicates the, that level of management in the, in the product. And, um, you know, the, obviously the PMO says we have to stay under 100,000 CFU per mil for individual producer raw milk from a TBC perspective, but um, really that's, that's not a quality indication if we have that level that that's a very poor quality um, raw milk. And, and so a sort of an acceptable quality specification um, generally is around 5,000 CFU per mil. Some say 10,000, but I think in contemporary milk supplies, we're really looking at 5,000. Um, and that could be even lower for individual cooperatives or producers. Um, we need to have some flexibility in how we define this, but 5,000 is a good sort of general um, number for that process control indicator. From a monitoring perspective, these tests we're going to use sort of periodically um, to assess parameters that really do impact finished product quality. And in raw milk, that's um, focused predominantly around spore forming bacteria. Um, so psycho tolerant spores that impact fluid milk quality, anaerobic spores that impact cheese quality, mesophilic and thermophilic spores that um, contribute to uh, spore levels in dairy powders. So, so using those as a um, sort of monitoring for specific organisms that cause issues in finished dairy product um, finished dairy products, where we initially develop a baseline in the supply, and then um, we can move to less frequent testing and monitoring for deviations in our baseline. Um, this is a really good opportunity for um, rewarding producers that can produce a consistent low, um, a consistent supply of raw milk that doesn't have high levels of those organisms that directly impact finished products. So this is not an indicator in this in this instance. These are absolutely having an impact on the finished product. And so through pay, premium payments, we can encourage the um, production of milk that that has low levels of, of these um, 
these organisms. And then finally, from a raw milk perspective with troubleshooting, I named a lot of tests earlier that are used in the industry um, that I didn't recommend using for process control or for monitoring, um, but that can be appropriately implemented for troubleshooting. So when we see our process control um, test deviate from our expected um, or our set point, um, so in this case, the, the TBC, then we can go back into that, that individual producer. We can use some targeted troubleshooting tests, whether it be a laboratory pasteurization count or coliform count on a case-by-case -case basis. And we can pair that and it should be paired with some sort of um, farm level risk assessment for those, um, for those organisms of concern that are causing that increase in the, in the TBC. And so we need to do that at the same time because the test by itself doesn't give us the, the full picture of why we're having an, an issue with our process control. Um, moving to finished product and environmental uh, microbiological testing. I'll walk through the same framework because this is just, you know, how I kind of think about the um, the testing that that we do. So starting with prevention for for the processing side, um, really the prevention here is going to focus on um, testing environments. So we want to prevent the contamination of our finished product that's already gone through our um, processing uh, parameters from being contaminated with pathogens or being contaminated with organisms that could cause quality deterioration. Um, but really, we want to look for harborage sites. And that's the sort of concept of seek and destroy that we talk about a lot with environmental monitoring for pathogens, where, where the goal is to find harborage sites in the facility and eliminate those um, and, and prevent contamination of the finished product with those pathogens. Um, and again, this can be applied to, you know, spoilage microorganisms as well, especially things like yeast and mold that live very well in environments, in processing environments. And then I included the development of digital tools here as a preventative um, tool because, not because it's a microbiological test, but because um, it uses the data that we develop uh, through our microbiological testing, and it gives us the ability to make decisions that are based on um, the data that we develop from, from these products to prevent and reduce microbial contamination um, in the finished product. So this really is a prevention tool. Um, it's not a traditional microbiological test, but I think we should include it when we're thinking about our microbiological testing um, schema at the processing level, um, especially. We have process control tests in, at the, the on the processing side. Again, our goal for these tests are to identify when we have process deviations. Um, they provide less information when we try to use them on a sort of a lot to lot basis, but good information when we're, when we're thinking about is our process in control. Um, a lot of the finished product testing that we do could be construed as process control testing. So if you think about uh, coliform testing in the in the dairy industry, when we have coliforms in a finished product um, that's been pasteurized, that tells us something about the process that that product went through. Um, and so obviously our process control is, is not um, well managed. But um, when we get to monitoring, these are, you know, a little bit overlapping. There's not, you know, sort of hard defined lines here, but um, process control is definitely um, important and we can use indicators for that. Um, again, the, the, for every product, because with raw milk, it's a very standard product, right? It's, it's raw milk, um, such that it is. There's obviously um, some variations, but our finished products are, are extraordinarily variable. And so when we set a quality, an acceptable quality specification, or we um, are even choosing the right microbes to look for, for process control, it's not trivial because we have so many variations in products, so many different types of processes. Um, so that, that needs some thought as far as how do you choose a, an adequate um, process control. With monitoring, again, we're targeting specific either specific organisms or specific groups of organisms that actually cause issues in the in the finished product when we're doing um, monitoring 
typically these are in very low levels and that it makes it tricky. And I'll talk a little bit more about low level contamination, um, but they might require enrichment either because, um, you know, they're, we do that through like shelf life testing where we let the product sort of sit as it um, ages or we do some sort of a, um, you know, higher temperature enrichment of that product. And then um, what, what's really important with monitoring at the finished product level is that an action is required when there's a deviation. So we have to have some sort of a follow-up to um, a microbiological test that we're using as a monitoring tool. And I'll talk more about that a little bit. Um, and then troubleshooting, again, um, often focuses on, you know, really identifying where the source of a specific um, monitoring or process control deviation originated from. Um, sometimes it's driven by product spoilage, so something that we're not testing for, but is a unique spoilage event, so we'll do troubleshooting for that, and we have a variety of tools at our disposal. Um, and, you know, the, the way that we approach this with inline testing or swabbing or, you know, vector swabbing for pathogens, um, or even going back to pre-processing or the farm level for, for troubleshooting, there's so many different variations on how this can be approached, um, which makes it both challenging as well as, you know, we, we have a lot of flexibility in how we can um, do troubleshooting from a microbiological perspective. Um, and then just finally, this isn't just traditional microbiology, we can use, you know, subtyping or even whole genome sequencing to provide additional information on how to do this troubleshooting um, in an effective and, and accurate way. So, so when we utilize this framework, both at the farm and in the processing facility with clear expectations of what our goals are, I think it allows us to um, develop very efficient microbiological testing that provides actual information. I hear far too many times from both um, at the production level and at the processing level, well, we do that test, but we don't really do anything with it. You know, we don't, we don't um, change anything. If it's out of specification, you know, it, we don't do anything. So, so we want to avoid doing that. So we have this framework that helps us to think through our goals at each of these levels. Um, and that will, will ultimately improve the outcomes for our product um, and for our, you know, our business. So I'm going to switch over now to just some, some pitfalls that I've seen a lot in the, in the industry um, that I wanted to bring up as food for thought as we, we think about microbiological testing and how to, how to implement that. Because I think it's one thing to have this framework and to think through, okay, here's how I'm gonna approach this at the farm and, and the processing facility. Um, but the actual implementation, I, I always tell folks, the devil is in the detail when it comes to microbiological testing, because there are so many details to think about and so many things to be, to be concerned with. And changing any one of those things can influence the outcome and then the interpretation of those tests. So, so I want to walk through this a little bit, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So the first pitfall um, that I see is, is using ideal conditions for shelf life testing. So a lot of folks do shelf life testing um, in-house and it's an important thing to do. I work a lot with fluid milk processors and obviously they wanna understand how their product is gonna perform over their 17 or 21 or 25 day shelf life. Um, but we have to remember that the goal of shelf life testing is, is to mimic realistic conditions. You know, we don't wanna throw the best case scenario at our product and see how it performs. Um, it's great if it performs well under those conditions, but we wanna know if it's in the marketplace, are we gonna see an issue in that product over the shelf life? Um, and so we need to consider parameters like what temperature are we using for our, our shelf life testing? What in some products, the humidity is, is important or the light exposure of that product is important or the headspace. Um, and speaking of headspace, I'll, I'll just show you one of my favorite examples of, um, of shelf life testing. So this is a, a fluid milk product. We were working with a facility a few years ago who was having a lot of consumer complaints um, on their product. The product was turning gray and um, they weren't seeing it in their in-house retains. They were doing shelf life testing, never saw gray products, but they were getting a lot of consumer complaints. Um, well, it turns out that this product was contaminated with this uh, strain of Pseudomonas that produces pigment, but it only does this 
when there's headspace present in the container. And so the company that was manufacturing this product was holding their retains completely full. They were unopened containers till the end of shelf life and they were fine because there was no headspace in the container. But obviously in the marketplace, we want our consumers to be drinking that product, right? So they're opening it, they're pouring a glass of milk um, and then there's headspace in the, the container and it was turning gray. And so hopefully you can see in my um, picture here that this container here um, has a distinct off color um, from the rest of these. So these are um, four experimental milks these two here are controls, a full control and a half um, control with headspace. No pseudomonas in those ones. They look great. Um, and these two are contaminated Oops, with this strain of pseudomonas. This one has the exact same level of bacteria as this one, except this one is full. And you can see that it is not gray at all. There's no color change. Um, but in this one, we have this distinct gray color. And that's because there's headspace there. So, so the, sometimes there are some unique um, sort of shelf life factors to consider. And this facility happens to continue to store half, half full containers of product over shelf life um, in order to, to catch this particular defect. But um, Every parameter matters when you're when you're doing shelf life, even even things that you wouldn't consider. Uh, pitfall number two: no test is perfect, um, and I kind of alluded to this a couple of times, but all microbiological tests have limitations from a variety of different perspectives. Um, and I think what's really important is not looking for a test that doesn't have limitations, but understanding fully what the limitations of the test that you're using are and then how does that impact your goal of you know process control or monitoring or troubleshooting because having that knowledge will let you um you know either supplement that that test with another test or change how you're you're approaching it um but having that knowledge is really the key to to understanding um and interpreting those test results. So things to consider. Does the test you choose target the primary um, causative agent of quality deterioration or whatever your goal happens to be? So if we're, we want to know what, uh, if our product is contaminated after pasteurization, let's say we're making a fluid milk, um, we know that coliforms represent a very small proportion of the population of post-processing contaminants in contemporary fluid milk. And so, Pseudomonas represents the most common. And so if we want to know is our product contaminated after pasteurization, we need to look for pseudomonas and not for coliforms. So, so understanding what the primary drivers of um, quality are, are very important because we need to choose a test that looks specifically for that. And as I mentioned um, in the last pitfall, all the parameters matter, the time, the temperature, the media that you use, the plating method. You need to understand each of those things. Um, when you're choosing a test. Um, is the method validated with your food matrix? This comes into play a lot with some of the more rapid methods that are out there um, that are not all validated for all of your, your product um, matrices. So any little change in your product um, could impact the ability of that test to function correctly. So knowing, knowing um, if it's validated for that. Um, are there sample size limitations? And I guarantee you there are sample size limitations. So just understanding what are those sample size limitations? Um, and especially when we're talking about low level contaminants, and I'll talk about that a little bit next. Um, do your analysts have adequate training? And I know this is a big issue in the industry right now, and it's something that we're hearing a lot because there's a lot of turnover um, in labs, in industry labs, and um, folks, there's not a lot of training opportunities. So there's a lot of folks out there who, who maybe don't have the adequate training, who maybe don't know how to interpret a test. Um, and so that's something that folks are, are really dealing with. It's a big challenge from a testing um, perspective right now is getting those folks trained um, to do those tests. Are appropriate controls conducted? Um, that's always something that, that we look for um, when we want to interpret a, a result, especially if it's an unexpected result, what were the controls? And then are confirmatory tests needed? And again, this is more in line with um, a lot of the pathogen testing that's done and Martin Weinman did a great um, office hours presentation on this, I think last fall, um, but really knowing what 
the method requires and if there's a confirmation step in that method and, and was that done and performed correctly. Um, all right, pitfall number three, small testing volumes. And, I, and I've brought this up maybe a couple of times now about low level contamination. So I wanted to hit on this again because I think it's a really important concept. And when we're doing a microbiological test, it can make a huge difference um, in the outcome of the test and how we interpret that test. So I'm gonna go through like a little case study with you. And again, from, from fluid milk, because um, number one, because we, we work a lot with fluid milk, but number two, because this is a really big problem in, in fluid milk. So microbial contamination often occurs at very low levels in fluid milk. Um, it's very rare that immediately after pasteurization, we can find any kind of indicator organism, whether it's coliforms or pseudomonas or anything else. Um, and then spore forming bacteria, which you know, come in at the raw milk level and contaminate the product and survive pasteurization and grow in fluid milk. Those are also there at very, very low levels. So um, we know that all of the tests, the microbiological tests that we use have a limit of detection. Um, when we have a, um, let's say a Petri dish that has no colonies on it, we don't call that zero, right? We call it less than the detection limit. So our detection limit might be one CFU per mil. Um, but it's not that the, the organism wasn't in the product. We don't know that. <laughs> you know, we know that it was, it could not be there, um, or it could be there at low levels that we weren't able to detect with the method that we used. Um, as an example, post-processing contamination with things like pseudomonas um, often occurs at about a rate of of one cell per 100 mils, which is really low. Um, that's considerably below the, the limit of detection for most microbiological tests. Um, you know, typically they're gonna be one CFU per mil or even, you know, higher five or 10 or 20 CFU per mil. So we, you know, are very unlikely to take a mill of milk out of this um, gallon of milk and get a positive result at a rate of one cell per 100 mils, right? Um, but there are 3,785 mils of milk in that gallon. Um, so we're obviously not testing every single mil, but if we have a contamination rate of one per 100 mils of pseudomonas, um, that's about 38 eight cells per gallon of milk, which is quite a few because pseudomonas grows really well in fluid milk at low temperatures. And even if we had one, we would expect to see spoilage in that product probably before the end of the expected shelf life. So um, so 38 cells would be a pretty big deal if we you know, had that amount in that product, but we would be extraordinarily unlikely to find it, right? Um, and then we have the problem of, uh, for a lot of folks who are doing micro testing, they're not holding entire containers of product over the shelf life because it takes up a lot of space, right? And this is a, a bigger problem for a lot of our smaller processors, but if we were to take the milk um, from that gallon and pour it off into a smaller container and expect to get um, an accurate or adequate look at the shelf life of that product, we would be sorely um, disappointed because we would be very unlikely to find or to capture one of those cells in that, um, in that vial, which is about 60 mils for a two ounce vial. Um, in the, in the previous example, we had 38 cells in that entire gallon. So very unlikely that you would capture that microbial contaminant and therefore you would not see the true um, shelf life of that product. So increasing your chance of finding low level contaminants in dairy products, whether it's fluid milk or a different um, dairy product means that you have to use larger volumes to test for or larger um, quantities to to test over shelf life or for your enrichments, um, those kind of things. So ideally when we're, when we're doing shelf life testing, we're keeping that product in the original container because we wanna know how that container performs. Um, but minimally we suggest that you hold over at least over a hundred mils. So four ounces is um, about 120 mils for, for testing. But we still have problems with very low level contamination. Um, so in fluid milk, we see that, that sometimes the contamination rate is less than um, one per container. And so we might have one per three containers or 10 containers. Um, when that we send that out into the marketplace, the consumers are gonna find that, right? But we wouldn't 
be very likely to find that at all. And so um, this is an area of, um, of need in the industry is developing how do we sample for these low level contaminants. One very timely issue right now um, is Coronabacter, right? We, we can't test um, dairy powder in fine Coronabacter. It's not gonna happen. Um, it's at such extraordinarily low levels and um, low contamination rate that our only solution is prevention at the you know processing level, and then um, how do we we develop some sort of um, you know higher level mathematical um, thoughts on on sampling that will help us to understand what our risk is um, as opposed to you know my plate has Coronabacter or doesn't have Coronabacter. Low level contamination is a really big challenge. Pitfall number four, um, your data isn't working for you. And I run into this so often um, at all levels throughout the dairy industry. So I think it's really important. Um, when we want to get the most out of our microbiological testing, we're spending a lot of money on, on analysts. We spend a lot of money on, um, you know, even third-party labs. We spend a lot of money on media, on time, on space. Um, for doing this microbiological testing. And then if we're not using a system to manage that data, we are not getting the most out of that data. So um, we want to have accurate and comprehensive record keeping. We want to be able to easily go back and review those records in order to um, identify trends, right? To, to do root cause analysis if a problem arises, um, to improve efficiencies and practices in, in our um, business. So all of those things, good data management can facilitate, but if we don't have those things, then we're at a disadvantage to um, use our data effectively. So we should be keeping records, obviously, of the testing results. But in addition to that, we need to keep records of what SOPs were used. Again, the devil is in the details with microbiological testing. You need to have very good record keeping about what happened to get that result in order to have um, good interpre interpretability for that test. Um, and then we want to make sure we gather metadata. So we want to know what you know, date and time was it processed? What line did it come off of? Who was the analyst who did the testing? Um, you know, what lots of ingredients went into these things? So, so there's a lot of information that that um, can be captured that will facilitate this, um, um, you know, sort of uh, getting the most out of your data. And then how should we be keeping the data to get the most out of it? Well, ideally electronically um, and in a relational database. So, if you're familiar with Microsoft Access, that's a relational database where the records are kept in different sort of different spreadsheets, but they're all linked together by one um, unique identifier. And so when we change a record in one place, um, it's automatically updated in other places. And so for folks who do this in like Excel sheets, there's a big opportunity for sort of, you know, errors in either Entry, data entry or, you know, accidentally copy and pasting something, you don't have those same errors in relational databases. LIM systems are, are um, inherently um, typically relational databases so that we can manage data. This also makes it really easy to pull data out and to, to review it. So, so this is what we would go for um, if we had the opportunity to, you know, sort of start, start fresh. Um, but any electronic Record keeping is better than just paper and handwritten notes. So if you're thinking about doing like a quarterly review of all of your testing, um, doing that with handwritten notes or handwritten paper sheets is really, really challenging. But if you at least have it in a spreadsheet or something like that, it, it makes it uh, facilitates better um, accessibility to your data. And obviously the relational database is, is the, um, the best option. Then finally, pitfall number five, and I think pulling us full circle to how I started this is um, pitfall number five is not taking action on your results. So I, so I, I mentioned um, that I run into folks all the time who are like doing tests that they never um, look at, they never use the results of that, they're paying for this, they're using resources on this and, and they're not taking any action. Those are the tests we don't wanna do. If we don't have a goal, for the test, if we don't have a clear understanding of how we're going to use it, then it's not valuable to us. And we, so we should be focusing on tests that have value. Um, 
when we have a deviation from a defined expectation for that test, we should be following up on that test. Um, it's not just a, you know, you know, it goes in the folder or, okay, I, I received the PDF from the third party lab or whatever. Um, the action that we, that we take based on that test result that has deviated from our expected level, that action should also be predefined. So before we even start testing, and this is especially important when we're doing pathogen testing, um, we know exactly how we're gonna react when we have a positive result or when we have a result that's above our, our specification, our internal specification. Because if you don't, you won't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's much less likely that you're going to um, react in a way that, um, that follows up appropriately if you don't predefine what that looks like. Um, and then again, there should be this periodic review of these of these results. So yes, we have a, a test result that comes back to us every time we send out a product for testing or every time we, we test a product. Um, and obviously we're looking at those results and, and we wanna make react to those if we need to. Um, but taking a step back and periodically looking at all of that data together is really valuable for identifying long-term trends for, you know, again, like identifying efficiencies for, for you know, um, doing root cause analysis. So, so this is um, really important to have sort of a structure in place to do this periodic review. And it should include people that are outside of just the quality team. And I think it's really easy, um, you know, for some organizations to be like, well, this is what the quality team does. But most of the time when, when we're involved with sort of troubleshooting an issue, um, the most value comes in when we have people from maintenance, the engineer, the, you know, sanitation manager, like you bring in these people who are seeing different um, perspectives on your process um, or your product. And all of a sudden you're able to see a lot more than you were when it was just the quality team, nothing against quality teams, but, um, but it's very, very valuable. Okay. So um, hopefully that that gets us started with sort of some of my high level thoughts on microbiological testing. Um, obviously we can, you know, have a discussion about specific tests or, um, or within the framework of, of um, microbiological testing, how we would approach that. But um, this is my email address and um, I'm also happy for folks to reach out to me after today. 